zines, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I use zines the way maybe a lot of people would make films, mm. you know? They're kind of like still films. Like Snapchat stories. Yeah, sort of, so to speak, you know? Just like little adventures. I want that one then. Okay, you can have this one too. Okay. Yeah, the take the edge off that insanity. Yeah, I'm into um, this though. Thank you. I like this back one. Oh, thanks. Um, Gracias. For sure. Uh, particularly never cared about having my zines in stores. <laughs> like when I was a kid, I used to send stuff to Printed Matter just so I could make a collection of letters that say no. <laughs> um, but uh, that's so much better. You know, that's, that's what it's about. Just like chatting with people and like the zine is just a communicator. You know, it's like uh, not just the window or like documentation. It is its own art form, but it's it's like a you could keep a conversation going without like I'm gonna be talking to that girl later tonight, even though we'll never talk again. You know what I mean? And I think that's just the power of books. And for years and years and years, I just wanted to be a writer or a poet, you know. And I was obsessed with like Mallarmé and Baudelaire and like you know, all your people, but like <laughs> are the masters, you know, Lautremont. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not that good of a poet, <laughs> you know. Not everyone I'm can a, be a poet. I'm okay. Yeah, it's the hardest <laughs> profession in the world, especially yeah. nowadays. It's insane. Mm -hmm. But I'm like okay at poetry. I'm okay at photography. I think I'm pretty okay at building stuff. But like, if I put them all together, then it's something really special. Like, mm -hmm. I think my zines are special, but I couldn't. I wouldn't have the courage to say that about my sculpture or about my writing or anything, but I think my zines are fairly legit, I guess. Um, and when did you start making zines? First, I started, I guess, like everybody when I was a kid, when I was like high school, like 13, 14. It's like one of those things you have to do when you discover punk rock, mm -hmm. you know? And I grew up just outside the city, so there was a really strong Uh, New York culture, punk rock culture, zines, they were, ever, you know, it was easy. But but they were, you know, they were just like kid zines with like dirty jokes and like uh, skateboarding and simple stuff. And then I started Born to Kill when I was 21, I think. And if, so that was seven years ago. I've made like, I think 90 issues. Um, when I was a kid, and there's a joke, there's a flyer up there. This is just like another French anecdote. When I was a kid and I was still into the French authors, you see what it says? More issues than Balzac. <laughs> like that was what I wanted to beat, you know, because he wrote like a hundred books or something, you know. And yeah, it's like comédie humaine, but in zines. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's Born to Kill. And it's mm -hmm. like, it's the same way the... Um, His work tells all these different stories, but they kind of overlap, like characters overlap or situations and time overlap. Mm -hmm. I like to think there's a lot of overlap between, for example, a zine about pigeons and a zine about pornography, mm -hmm. because it's all, it's all my world, it's all my perspective, you know? Um, but I've, I've tried to make zines in all the different You know, there are mag you can make a magazine about anything. You can make a magazine about adventure or about fashion or about sports, mm -hmm. you know, you could... And so you chose uh, pigeons. I chose pigeons, but I also <laughs> tried, I wanted to try everything. I tried comic books, I tried photography, I tried pornography, because mm -hmm. pornography is such a big part of the magazine business. Um, pigeons is kind of where I landed because I found in my practice keeping pigeons, it's everything I ever wanted in the world all at once kind of mm -hmm. maybe so now I make a lot of pigeon zines but you know with the pigeons you get to study yeah geez you get to study your neighborhood because you're outside so there's architecture there's community there's sculpture there's living systems like waste management food management 
And so do you train them? All the stuff. Yeah, I train them. Yeah. Do I live there. I live in I live in that neighborhood in Brooklyn that's really popular for artists called Bushwick. Mm-hmm. And I moved there when I was young for the same reasons most people do because they're trying to find community and usually you're trying to find it in music or in arts or graffiti whatever you move to Bushwick for but I moved there and across the street from my house was a store that sells pigeons just for pigeon guys and I went in there and the first day I went in I walked out with a bird five dollars for a white pigeon and I learned that Bushwick is also the capital of pigeon flying in the whole country People move from all around the world to fly birds in Bushwick because it's all about, you know, you have a coop on this block, this block, this block. You want your neighbors to see and you kind of, you show them off for style, you know, you compete with your neighbors about how well your birds, how well you train them to fly. Um, so it's like, a, it's how I found a sense of place in my community, you know, being an outsider and moving into... And so you were distributing these pigeons in within the pigeon community? And, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I, I put a roof, uh, a coop on my roof, mm-hmm. and I started with five or ten and mm-hmm. more and more and more. And now I'm just one of the guys, mm-hmm. you know, like there's... Um, within two blocks of me, there are five other pigeon coops. Mm-hmm. And because I live right next to the pigeon shop, that's the club that's where everyone goes on the weekend to hang out and talk so there you know it's it's like any other community or culture mm-hmm. like there's a lot of subtlety to it and awesome details and, and so weird you get guys the, weird people your pigeons to deliver the zines they, that would be awesome <laughs> pigeons delivering that, a zine man. about pigeons hang on if must be too heavy, no? You see, I tried that one time, <laughs> and it was fucked up. Man. I wrote about it in one of my zines. Maybe mm-hmm. I could find it. It was such a tragedy, because the poor thing, you're right, it's too heavy for a pigeon. You should make a very tiny zine that they could yeah, deliver. I know, I know. <laughs> like, extra tiny. Oh, man, I don't know if I have it. But, like... I wanted so bad for a pigeon to fly with the zine, to fly mm-hmm. to my friend's house. So I picked, and this was, I was young, or I was new to keeping pigeons. I was an idiot still, pretty much a rookie. Um, so I got my biggest, strongest pigeon, like the fattest one. He was like the, f- yeah. And I tied the zine to his chest, and I like held him and tried to make sure he's okay. And he seemed okay. So I let him go, and, and he went like this. <laughs> And then, like, if the building, if this is my building, you know, and we're up here, he's like, and then he goes like this, and then he starts to go like this. And I was watching him go down, and in the other yard, there are big dogs, like big pit bulls, like everyone has in Brooklyn, you know? And I'm like, as the pigeon goes like this, and the dogs are like this, and he just barely got over the fence. Like, he just barely got onto the other side and was safe. And, and that... I was so close to killing that pigeon. Yeah, you know, you he, was, he was okay, again. he was fine, but I've never tried again. <laughs> and, I, and I've always been so embarrassed about that. I mean, I think it's really, I think it's really disgraceful on my mm-hmm. part, you know? And, and that's, that's an interesting thing you learn when you spend so much time with animals. There's always the urge, I think the word is anthro amorphize the, when you when you project human mm-hmm, characteristics mm-hmm, and mm-hmm, traits on the mm-hmm. animals and yeah. and people do that very casually in the city with dogs and cats you treat oh, yeah. them like little people you know <laughs> but when you live with hundreds of animals mm. especially when you're a city guy there's all these adjustments you have to make because you can't treat them like little people you can't mm. treat them like your kids they're um they're most definitely animals, you know, and you have to respect them as that. Hello. They're free. They're all free. Well, I'm free, free. It's part of that's part of the piece. Yeah. Everyone always asks me that. That piece. That piece actually won the grand prize of the Venice Biennale last year. Those posters. And can can you show that uh, to the camera? Uh, cool. <laughs> this? Yeah, that's perfect. So, so that's one of the. So this is things. one. Yeah, that's a pigeon feeding his baby. Mm-hmm. Um, born to kill, pigeoning, and then some of the highlights mm-hmm. from it. So, snowstorm. An essay. 
And then it goes into like the details. Like my mom got me these boots for Christmas mm -hmm. for the winter. <laughs> sharpening the scrapers the scrapers is how you clean the floor mm. there's lots of maintenance like every single day yeah, I have to go up imagine. there so there's there's a lot of stories to tell it's very mm. easy you know like the material is there mm. um, surveillance cameras I don't know big fucking winter storm <laughs> uh, shoveling shoveling so this is there's like a fold out. And this nice. is like different kinds of birds and um, I make ceramics. So I make all these bowls for them and they each have their babies in the bowl, you know? This guy called Ricky Badlands, he was the one I tried to fly with the zine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this poor guy. And then, you know, all kinds of like, when it gets really hot, you spritz them with water to cool them down. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I try to write like, I try for it to be very educational, or not educational, like informative. Mm -hmm. Like I want to tell the, the story exactly how it is, but it, you, you, know, you try to make it, in, not interesting, but you try to make it uh, poetic. Mm -hmm. You know, you try to make it like, I, I consider every single word, you know, mm -hmm. because I want it to be a real direct expression from my experience, mm -hmm. giving them bath, so yeah. And so can you tell us a bit about where we are and what this is? Um, <laughs> this is... This is like the luckiest thing to happen in New York in a long time. It's... Um, we're, in, we're in the modern, we're in the, the Museum of Modern Art, in the New Photography Biennial, in a, in a recreation of the newsstand, which was a... In a zine shop that was open for in 2013 in Brooklyn in the in a Williamsburg subway station, and the space opens, um, led by Lele Severi, and he got like 20 of us zine makers together and said, "I want to open this store for one month. Can you contribute zines? Can you come down and be a clerk for the day? You know?" And it was an actual store where you could come in while you were waiting for the train and like buy artist-made books. And it was so popular, and so many people started bringing zines that stayed open one more month, one more month, one more month, and ultimately was open for eight or nine months. And um, it became just like the real epicenter. It's not like it became the epicenter of a scene, it kind of created a scene. Mm -hmm. But not just a scene of like 20 or 30 artists, like a scene of a thousand people who were making zines. Some people very seriously. Uh, who only make zines and some people just make them once or twice or people's zines started coming from all around the world and like you know we talk about like the community of, of zine making uh, but this is like you know this is too many people to be a community this is like a town you know right now in this this is the recreation of how the newsstand was when it closed and there are 1200 zines in here from 1200 different artists um, all all living right now you know no grandpa's artists this is all like young and old people who are making stuff today and so how was it to be a clerk uh, in the in the subway it, was, it must have been pretty different than at the moment it's kind of kind of similar though like the way people like we're sitting here we're talking this is kind of like how it was like mm -hmm. friends would be hanging out mm -hmm. and people would just come in some people you start talking with some people not some people stay a long time some people leave quick some people don't like I don't get it. What is it? You know? And some people are like, oh my god, I've waited all my life. You know? <laughs> yeah, um, and so people who had no idea this kind of publication existed, so discovered for it. For sure, yeah, uh, yeah. Certainly, just and, <laughs> and it allowed, because we were underground, literally underground, like mm -hmm. in the subway system, in the metro, your phones don't work. Your phones <laughs> didn't work down there. So if people came in, they weren't distracted. They were like, they were actually looking at stuff, you know? The, they were actually talking, which is kind of like a, becoming a novel thing now, you know? Like we're so used to talking with our friends, but also talking with other people while mm -hmm. we're talking, you know? Um, and I, that's so important. I mean, books already do that, I think, where you pick up a book and you have to shut everything else off mm -hmm. because it's so, it's so close, it's so direct. That's one of the magical things about these books we make, but. I think that the location of the newsstand really underlined that, really made that 
that ideal a reality. Um, yeah, and maybe it, people felt concerned also because they saw that this was also people's everyday life, just like the subway was their everyday life. And, sure, yeah, yeah. And that's why this is a little far out because here we are in the, a museum. Mm -hmm. And not just any museum, but kind of like the museum, mm -hmm. at least in New York or at least in America and the mm -hmm. United States. So there's a weird situation here where I feel like it's tough to get people, it's tougher to get people to really get into this stuff because they're in this building with some of the greatest works of art in the freaking world. <laughs> And they're only here in the building for a couple hours. They have a lot to see. You know, there's a Picasso, there's the Bruterre show upstairs. There's a lot to see. So it's tough because people come in, and even if they really like it, there's a pressure to keep going on with their life. Back when we were in the subway station, people would forget about their life. Mm -hmm. You know, and you would come yeah, in. They, and would, they would miss one they train miss, or, yeah, or yeah, exactly, an exactly. or another because they, they started looking exactly. at things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's. And that's what, you know, that's how the, the small balls rolled, rolled, you know, got really big because mm -hmm. people were kind of spending so much time here and it got to the point where um, we, they, Lele started asking artists to do art shows here or in the, in the <laughs> subway. <laughs> and, um, and it got to the point where there would be an art show every single night. So for like a year, there was a place where you could go every night and you didn't have to see the flyer, you didn't have to hear about it, you could just go there and know there would be an event. Mm -hmm. You could just show up and know there was going to be 30 people, 100 people hanging out and talking. Mm -hmm. And you could see there's video of it down there, you know, and, and I used to make these zines, I used to make these zines like this one, mm -hmm. and I'm actually going to try to, I'm going to try to make one today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a surveillance camera, mm -hmm. you see? motion activated okay. and I would set it up and it would take it takes automatic photos like with the time mm. of the event see that's you know this was actually this was shot the night that um, they did a big rap circle like a cipher and do you know the rap crew uh, Rat King Rat King are like these great rappers from New York today like I don't know, but in the middle of this pit of people is is them freestyling, <laughs> okay. and they're they're really great. They're really aggressive. They're real. They're kind of like a almost like a Beastie Boys mm -hmm. kind of trio, you know. But you could see how many people were there. You know, it was always always a happening. You'd meet so many people. You know, you'd like make so many friends. Oh. Well, but, thank you so much, Patrick. Sure, sure. Sorry, <laughs> that was like a lot of information. No, I no, that's perfect. Much.